We begin in Kenya, where the country marked the first memorial of the Garissa University attack. Names of the 148 killed during the 16-hour siege have been written on a plaque at the front of the university. In Garissa, the day was marked with prayers and candlelight vigils by students, family and friends of those killed, as well as government officials. Others also participated in a marathon to commemorate the day. The school opened its doors to some private students and staff members in early January. At least 600 public students were transferred to an official University. Most of most, if not all of them, now say they will never return. Officials hope that more students will register in the 2016-2017 academic year, which kicks off in September. Since the attack, a police force has been established within the campus. They happy because I'm showing all my strength in solidarity with the, the slain brothers, Kenyans, dear children. I had in this university. I'm happy that I participated in this marathon to show that I remember them after one year of them going away and leaving us behind. We're here that uh, as a country, we remember this day, even if it is one year later, we will stand with those parents. We want to tell them together as a country, from the north to the south, to the west to the east, from the Muslim to Christians, from all the 42 communities in our country, from our neighbors, from the global community, international community, together we must fight all forms of terror. Let's get more of the day's activities from our correspondent, Jen Kea, who's been following the events in Garissa town. Jen, remembering that massacre one year down the line, how is the university coping? Uh, what's the mood like there? Well, Penina, it's simply heartbreaking. A year on the community here, and I would say to a large extent Kenyans, because Penina, once you get here, it hits you. You sort of get that feeling of what it is that happened here a year ago, and it's been a slow healing process. Uh, the university is still virtually empty. It reopened in January, but like we've been saying, only 160 students have registered to study here, and this is students mainly from the local community. Remember, the university was hosting about 700 students in years past, and uh, about 600 of the surviving students uh, were transferred to different colleges and universities across the country. None of them, save for one who actually made it late in the afternoon for today's event, uh, made it to the anniversary to commemorate, you know, uh, that fateful event of last year. And of course, it's been an issue of coping. We'll be speaking to, uh, to that student who actually made it to today's event later on, and he'll be telling us about how exactly he's coping, why exactly he felt it was important to come here. But of course, the issue has been coping and for those we've spoken to here they say it's been slow it's, it's hard they are struggling to move on we've heard from the principal we've heard from a teacher from also the students and also we spoke to uh, the head of the guidance and counseling uh, department here at Garissa University her name is Hadija Mohammed if you remember her name went viral when she was trying to comfort some of the grieving students during that attack and she told us the same, that it's a difficult process and they're really struggling to pick up the pieces take a listen coping with difficulty, with difficulty, because when I see coping, I can't cope when I lose all my children who had been talking to them immediately at that time. And then I was told that the, the children who were with them yesterday, you lost them. So it was a shock as a mother, as a counselor, it was a shock to me and I can't cope. I'm coping with difficulty at the moment, even I don't go side of the hostels where the children were sleeping. I don't normally step that side because when I go there, I start having my tears coming up. I cannot even control my tears. And that hug I've given to those two girls, it is a feelings hug. Empathy, I was empathy with the student who lost their friend under their families. So it's a sort of, it's a sort of imagination. Even I have suffered for almost three weeks when the attack happened. So, Jen, one of the key issues that emerged from that massacre was the extent to which Kenyan youths had been recruited to join radical groups such as the Al Shabaab. Are there answers yet on why the group appeared to have taken root among some Kenyan groups? Not really, Penina, and of course there are different theories about this, and uh, it certainly it does certainly appear to have taken root among the marginalized community. 
or even the disenfranchised and like you said it's mainly targeting the youth and these are people who feel segregated for one reason or the other it could be because of uh, religion it could be because of unemployment poverty or ethnicity now some sort of feel that uh, one of the gunmen one of the four gunmen who took part in that in those attacks last year his name was uh, Abdi Abdirahim Abdullahi he was 26 year 26 year old that was the case, that was his case now this is a man who disappeared in 2013 he was reported missing and family and friends say they only heard about him once his bloodied image went viral after the attacks now Penina we did manage to catch up with his former high school lecturer uh, high school literature teacher and a former friend actually his desk mate who actually told me that they are still struggling to reconcile you know this man they knew as a jovial playful you know an easy going and of course an A student he was very bright to the person he had become which was a mass murderer in 2015 he was playful eh? since he was i think he was one of the youngest guys in our class he was the youngest and uh, he was very bright he wasn't even too religious you would say that he wasn't too religious. He's a student who, you know, could go to even the clubs with his friend and until he disappeared. Memories of a young man who died a year ago today. Abdi Rahim Abdullahi was a straight A student who loved football and he had a great career ahead of him as a lawyer. Yet on 2nd April 2015, he and his friends spent hours executing young people like himself in the name of religion. It was only when they saw this picture, Abdullahi dead in a pool of blood, that friends and family discovered just what he had become. Abdullahi is thought to have joined Al-Shabaab soon after graduating from this university in Nairobi in 2013. His family told authorities of their suspicions with little effect. A year on, they are reluctant to talk. But we meet Abdullahi's former high school teacher in Isili. Yes. It's an area of Nairobi Abdullahi frequented and has a large Somali population. You couldn't feel that he was a student going in that direction. There was no suspicion of anything at all. Yeah. So when he did what he did, it was really a shock to all of us. Bashir says authorities could have done more when Abdullahi's family reported him missing. The police did not even publish his picture. Any person may have seen him somewhere and report him, but they took it so casual. A lot of other, you know, youth have disappeared, not just Abdurrahim, but then we don't see their pictures at that time. They, nowadays, the things are changing. At least a few faces are printed uh, in the newspapers, shown in the uh, mainstream uh, media. But at that time, the case was reported, they recorded it, and they left it there. And the next thing was 148 students were dead. That was preventable, if you ask me. Mm. Yeah. Former classmate Hassan Kipto agrees, but he says Abdullahi did not become radicalized one day and join Al Shabaab the next. Parents will keep tabs with uh, their children, even if they are going for they going to the university. Sometimes the, the notion is that uh, when you're 18 years old, eh, they let you go. You can do whatever you want. Uh, they don't follow you. They don't follow up even on uh, what you're doing in school, because uh, they say that uh, you passed and you're in university. You are good to you, it's okay, you can do anything. But let's say our parents should uh, keep tabs more with uh, what your son is doing. Mostly his behavior or her behavior will change when you're when you in university. Because uh, you meet uh, people with a diverse culture. Al Shabaab recently has begun printing its propaganda pamphlets in Swahili to appeal to Kenyans. And the content focuses on the grievances of young Kenyan Muslims rather than Somalis. He had a cousin. Kipto says that's what attracted his friend. Technically it is emotions and, uh, and people uh, go to him eh? with his emotions and what is happening in this world. I think the radicals go to him. But even now, few who knew Abdirahim Abdullahi can believe just what he did. Jin Keo, CCTV. Well, Pen Penina, remember Abdirahim Abdullahi is just one among dozens or possibly hundreds of Kenyan youths who have crossed over into Somalia and are fighting for Al-Shabaab. And also remember he's the only one, one of the
the only one of the four gunmen who was identified uh, in the in the Garissa attacks. And just as we wind up, let me speak to, like I told you, one of the survivors, rather the survivors, the only surviving student who made it to this uh, to these events today here at Garissa University. He's called Peter Wekesa. And I was going to ask you, Peter, why did you feel it was important for you to come commemorate today, uh, given the, tra the, the tragic events that happened and the traumatic events? Okay, for me, I felt it and I just wanted to heal from my heart and to come and confirm if it actually happened. And for I have actually confirmed it, that it happened, and uh, at least I have healed. That disbelief is now out of my mind. And for me, I just pray that God Almighty bless our fellow students who left us. And uh, we also wish that the, the, these things could not happen again. Yeah. And just a, a final question, just uh, it was your first time to come back since the event, and I'm sure you knew a couple of those students uh, personally. How was it like for you to step especially into the dormitory and just entering the gate today? Uh, as I have said, I just came to move that mind of this of what happened and uh, to heal in my heart. So mostly most of my friends whom we were associating in class, whom were doing the same courses, the, the ones who have been hindering my mind and I just said like, no, me as a person, I can't go there and uh, see what happened and where they were. I have gone there to the rooms where they were sleeping and I have seen it is gone. Yeah. All right. We do wish you the best. Thanks. Penina, so that's about it from us here in Garissa. Tomorrow we'll be telling you more about, you know, the recruitment of these young people, especially in a slum there in Nairobi. Back to you. All right, Jane Kerry reporting live for us there in Garissa. Many thanks, Jane.